everyone and welcome back. We are already at our last of the nine episodes. We are talking about altruism today with Sarah Atkinson, whom you already know, but is in a different role today. So uh, I am here again, your faithful co-host Renee Show. My pronouns are she, her, and I am located on the beautiful but unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, also known as Chelsea, Quebec. And we are joined here today by someone whom you might remember from earlier on in our program, Brian Tohanna. Brian, please tell us a bit more about yourself. Hello. Yes, thanks. I'm the Empathy Coach. I believe empathy and better communication is what's needed to create a peaceful world and peaceful relationships. So I'm really excited to have a chance to interview uh, Sarah today. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fun to have the roles reversed. And for those of you watching at home, it is Sarah's birthday today. She's on her birthday. Happy birthday, Sarah. Thank you so much. Well, I know I've introduced myself already eight times before, but might as well wrap up week nine with, I am Sarah Ann Atkinson, and I'm a yoga teacher, yoga tune-up teacher, Thai masseuse, somatic sex educator, and just a really interested human being in constantly learning from every one of you in this project. I go by she or they, and I live in the unceded territory of the Wendat, Algonquin, and Anishinaabe people, also known as Ottawa. Thanks, Sarah. This is super fun for me to have you on the other end. I know. I'm like, where's my clipboard? <laughs> Not today. We're, not We're just going here unscripted. Um, so, Sarah, can you start by helping us understand what we mean when we say altruism and being altruistic? What is that exactly? Absolutely. And I do find that as we go through this journey in the pillars, it's really lovely to leave it to the later aspects of things, to know that working on the self is such a pivotal point of being able to then act for other. The idea of altruism is in a sense that we have taken this self-care that we've created, um, this sovereign and, and really strong being, and that we can take action with that forward to community, to society, to someone, not our, our neighbor in a grocery store. It's so that we can act for other. And the simple purpose is not for ourselves. We may even benefit from and get joy from that experience. Um, but uh, looking at a situation in need, something that's difficult that someone else is going through, that can be anywhere from helping carry someone's groceries to giving to um helping to rebuild someone's home after a devastating fire loss. Like there's so many ways that that can come across an altruistic act, but essentially it's that we see someone else in a position of need and we are able to provide that service or that gesture uh, coming from a wholehearted place. And when we think of like an altruistic figurehead, someone in the world that maybe everyone knows about, we know Mother Teresa, she's spent her entire life devoting to, or we can think, think of also some of the uh, meditative monks that have devoted their entire lives to living in temples, meditating for peace and harmony in humanity. And these are people that it's a bit of self-sacrifice or self-service in the greater cause of the world. Mm, nice. Deep, deep stuff. And how is altruism related to why you chose to do happiness habits, if it is at all? It very much is connected as to why I pitched forward that we do a vlog video series, that we do some meditations and gather community once again. Um, I gained benefit from, I sort of got to reap the rewards from the previous iterations of happiness habits when I attended this past February, where I got to meet you, I got to meet Brian, I got to meet Amanda Cotro, uh, Stephen, Tammy, like so many brilliant names out there to see this is how they're showing up is to bring their skills, their gifts, their strengths and energies and abundant community that may be having some difficulty in, at that point, it was like, well, winter is really tough. Let's gather people, let's have community gatherings. I love the initiative, the idea, this ultimate question, how do we be happy? It is a huge, uh, lots of people ask it and then they'll see someone who's happy. How'd you do that? How'd you get that? And, you know, it isn't something you can go to the store and buy. You, you can't just pick the order on Amazon, click it's in your cart. Happiness is something that by fulfilling all those things, we can then experience or allow. So when I went in February, I was so moved by these people showing up of their own volition um, that 
I thought COVID hit, pandemics hit. I personally am struggling yet again with mental health, with feeling pretty low. And whenever I personally am feeling pretty low and I stay in my lowness by myself and I isolate further, I can feel pretty hopeless and helpless. As soon as I reach out to another human and I connect to that human, and I maybe even share my story and they're like, wow, you came through that? That's amazing. And it, the, the sharing of our souls, the sharing of the load of this struggle, um, me being able to talk about ways and habits that not only make us happy and not in a toxic, positively light, but let's say we all struggle together, that phrase alone and sharing our personal struggle, struggles helps those around us to feel united, feel together, feel that, um, that sense of community. And from there, as I've asked each and every one of you to be part of this project, and I had no idea initially like what it could become or what things would come out of it, um, I've not only gained some insights into my own depression, my own difficulty, I've felt very satiated by bringing this to the good news network of social media. Yeah, which we need so much right now. And that's the world that we're creating mm. together, right? What do we want to see when we turn our, our phones and our screens on? Um, I really appreciate you being able to ask me about why I got involved. And I'd love to flip that question for you, Renee. Why did your altruistic calling uh, show up in this project? Yeah, um, for me, it's creating purpose for me. Um, so at a time when, like you say, we're spending more time alone, isolated, we're not able to connect in the same ways that we do by creating something. I feel very purposeful, very fulfilled. It's altruistic, obviously, because I'm doing it from my own heart. You know, there's no financial remuneration. Um, mm. it feels good to me. And I want to keep that as a part of my life. And, um, there's also a sense of friendship. I think that's formed too, through all of this, right? So uh, having known you a little bit, but not that well, I've gotten to know you so much better. Same thing with Brian. Now we're on our second video and I learn more about him and um, there's friendship that's created uh, through creative projects. So it's altruistic, but it's also beneficial. I, I don't think that one is possible without the other really. Brian, how about you? Yeah, I think what appealed to me most about happiness habits that I focused on in my interview was really how foundational habits are. We have to be consistent, right? In some way in all of these pillars. And so, as you know, I created uh, the 30-day meditation experiment as a way of helping people uh, create that consistency in their lives. And it's been a real gift for me. Every time mm -hmm. I get and record every day that meditation, it's something that I feel accountable to, to serve others that feels like from the heart, with, like you said, no remuneration. And it's really magical to just give and to feel how much purpose and meaning that I receive through that giving. And there's a creative component too, it seems, right? It's you. Yes, well said. Thoughts, feelings, and making something, like you're birthing something. Mm -hmm. The creative process itself is inherently very fulfilling, although Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Yeah, so let me set some context for the next question here for you, Sarah. So, you know, if I imagine I put myself in the shoes of the listeners, I'm, you know, many people are like me and us who are highly sensitive individuals. Maybe we consider ourselves empaths, super caring, giving individuals. And so we find ourselves with compassion fatigue or burning out. Mm -hmm. You know, we're told giving is such a good thing. And so there's this line that we have to navigate, right? Of honoring self and honoring other. And so how do we really like do altruism, which is kind of defined as like selfless service and not burn out? There's like boundaries that come into play here, right? So how do we practice managing our boundaries? What, how does that connect to altruism for you? Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian, for the, the contextual question. Um, it is very important to start as that foundational piece that, of course, you say there's like this sort of societal ingrained belief and, all, and we feel it a bit more as empaths that, of course, we feel good when we give. There's like this, aha, like glowy, nice light feeling. I did something for someone else, gold star. Um, we know that we helped lift someone's burden. And then this can 
perhaps in some relationships become a pattern where we feel a bit of maybe personal obligation. When I do this, I know that the person is happy. I make them happy. That makes me happy. And if I don't do the thing that they want me to do or that is being asked of me, I've already made these 10 commitments. If I don't do all this, then that sort of takes my self-worth or takes my, my glowy feeling a little less than. So really come back to if first you can check in with actually how much energy you have invested already in yourself. Have you already fed yourself? Have you already water slept well are, are you in a good place to give is your cup overflowing or is it kind of a half full cup what i really like to think about is this example that I, i'm i'm tired and someone has asked me to do something and i'm going to do it out of obligation but later i might actually resent a little bit that i did this because i really needed for myself first and so if i can honor that there was a boundary there that maybe i could have offered them a set amount of time I could have offered them another day. I could have offered them knowing that it won't be my best effort, that, that it will just be that I'm a little tired today. And may, those are maybe some ways of being accountable to your own boundaries before that act of giving. And ultimately asking yourself, who is that act of giving for? If it is for you to make you feel better, then that's not altruism. That is actually just a boost of our ego and our self-confidence. And it can feel great, but I will say that it's this sort of short-lived quick fuse. It's not something that um, continues in that habitual sense to be something that will leave our batteries at a more charged state. That when we act from a place that is going to be... Um, I know that I may have to give up some of my time to help this person, some of my money or some of my energy. Those are often the type of sacrifices that exist. Um, but I know I'm doing it from for them fully and also that they want to receive it. So if I think that I'm giving this thing to you and I'm, oh, I feel so great. I'm giving you a bag of my old donated clothing, Renee. Like how nice of me. But what if you don't actually want it? Then is that still altruism? Like that whole consensual piece of, I would love to do this gesture for you. And is that welcome comes into to play here. Okay. I love how when I'm hearing what you're saying is kind of like, where are, is the giving coming from? Is it coming from obligation, from some type of expectation, from some role in which mm -hmm. I derive value? And maybe that's not the place that we want to necessarily be giving from to do that check in first with ourselves. Um, am I getting you right so far? Absolutely. And I don't know why it's coming to mind, but you shared that um, Byron Katie's The Work movie with me. And there's that one example of the woman who like is so distraught about polar bears. And so she really needs to save. If you haven't seen this video, it's amazing. And, and she is, she's genuinely distraught. So her whole life mission is to somehow take care of them first and maybe herself second. And it was an attitude shift that Byron Katie took her with that you can still have the altruistic purpose of caring for the polar bears, but do it out of love. Do it out of a, a healthy and grounded place and out of self-love mm. mm -hmm. versus I just feel like helpless and I'm kind of operating out of fear kind of thing. Yeah. Like I don't deserve to be happy unless I've taken oh. care of blah, blah, blah. Well said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. A deserving that worthiness. Yeah. It's so nuanced. I feel like we're not born with this instinct or we're not aware that that's what we have. Cause when we're being asked to do something, or we offer, uh, I feel like that's a muscle we need to practice to be like, huh, what things in my body tell me that I am full or not full? Mm. What are those signs you mentioned tired. Um, I'm thinking about um, hungry. I'm thinking about uh, oh, yeah. time in my day or my week, other things that I start to think about. Um, creative capacity. Do, can I create more today, tomorrow? You know? Yeah. So I think that's, self-awareness, which is something that we all practice. And I know that's a big thing of what you coach around too, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sarah and I are creating a boundaries workshop. So this is really about, I guess it sounds like navigating the fluidity. There is no hard and fast line here, right? That's why it is the self-check-in habit seems to be, is that what you're recommending, Sarah? The, the most important thing before you just, you know, say yes to a, a request? 
Absolutely. And even the requests that you've already said yes to, you have the right to recheck in with yourself in the moment. In, in Let's say you've said yes and you're in the middle of starting it and check in again. That like to truly act in altruism means that we have to come from this deep seated, I'm taking care of what I need to take care of here so that when I start to take care of you and I start to take care of you, it is coming from tapping into unconditional loving kindness. And if I know that I'm kind of putting myself last and myself last, that even what I'm giving to others might not land for them. It might not be received in which the way that they truly needed. Let's say I show up to an event as a volunteer, but I'm really distracted in my own life stuff and I'm not able to focus but they need someone to be pretty on with whatever their their role or their duty is. Honoring that and saying, hey, I've shown up today to give this and this is where I'm arriving, maybe can help to to place you in a role or to reshift yourself. Yeah, that, that self-boundary, that that self-check-in is like integral mm -hmm. throughout. I feel like that can go both ways too, right? So it's we have the control to show up and to say, here's where I'm at, here's what I need, here's how I can help, here's my capacity. But I think it's also an opportunity for anyone listening and for ourselves to practice as the person who's asking something of someone. When we do ask them, we can reframe the way that we ask them and check in with them first, instead of like, oh, oh my gosh, yes. How are you feeling about this? Do you have this capacity right now? Like when people ask me that, I'm like, wow, I feel so like, honored and cared for and like thank you for giving me that um opportunity because maybe i don't always take it for myself well said yeah sarah can you um tell us a bit more about how altruism and boundaries show up for you as a parent which i'm sure uh, many people are listening and uh and are thinking about that yeah and if i can just add a piece there that i've seen so frequently is like it feels selfish to put yourself first or to do what's best for you like especially like as a mom in that role and i see that people struggle with that so much you know it's like disappointing others is so challenging mm, yeah in parenthood in motherhood um there is even this concept that they talk about, put your own oxygen mask on before taking care of other. However, I'll tell you, when you get into that primal brain of you've got your newborn right in front of you, you've got your toddler screaming because they've hurt themselves, something about our biology still wants us to act first for other and then maybe check in with the self. So it, it feels like this counter normative practice that I'm doing. And especially when I um, challenge this generationally. So I'm talking to people around my grandparents or my parents' generation. They may adamantly disagree with me that I don't have a right to take care of myself first. That let's say by making sure I'm taking care of me, they're like, oh, well, your children deserve better. They, they deserve the, the first priority here. Because I come from a little bit of a, a background with experiencing polyamorous relationships, this idea of understanding what human hierarchy can play out like. Um, as soon as I had a child and I started to feel myself overgiving, and it wasn't like I resented my baby, geez, he's a baby, but I could resent myself for overgiving. I noticed that, that I was not taking care of me and that that led to me not showing up fully as a parent. So it was this, like I said, a counter normative shift to saying, what if I'm my primary? And then my child can also be a primary, but if I'm, if each primary is not being taken care of in the same way, if I wouldn't take care of myself the same way I'd equally take care of him, then my container's still not full. So sometimes what that looks like is me making sure he's in a totally safe situation and geez, I've experienced a heck of a lot of overwhelm through the pandemic. So it may mean I go to the other room and I cry a lot. Maybe I scream into a pillow. I don't know. <laughs> I could get wherever with. Um, it means reaching out to my support network of people and asking them for nights off or time off that I can take breaks for myself. Um, oh, well, he wants to watch a TV show. Maybe I'm also listening to my own podcast or my own meditation. I've kind of taken into consideration myself first. And I found that the more that I do that and I come back to him as a parent, 
there's no regrets. It's not like, oh, wow, I was so selfish because I know I'm doing it for the cause of being the best parent I can be. I'm not doing it just to be self-fulfilling. I don't know if that answers your question there, Brian. Yeah, that is. What I'm, go ahead, Renee. Yeah, I was gonna say, it sounds like you're talking about intention, right? And again, that nuance, um, reflective approach of thinking, what is my intention here? Why am I doing this? Is it for me? Is it for someone else? Am I avoiding? And I'm, am I filling up my cup? Like, we really need to know ourselves to uh, understand why we're doing something. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I'm really hearing that it seems like giving can both empty your cup and fill it up simultaneously. And so that like self check in to just see like, where am I at is so important. So I'm really happy that we've brought that to everyone today uh, as a habit of just that kind of, would you say a breath and a pause and to feel into your body, Sarah? Ooh, do we want to do it like right now? Like make a request you mean, or just feel in? <laughs> You're right. I can be super clear here, Brian. Um, would both of you be willing to take a sacred pause with me right now? Absolutely. Okay. So what that looks like, and it can be different for different people. Um, this idea that in any externally noisy situation, requests are being made of us, we're in a traffic jam, we're um, in a house full of people, what, whatever that looks like, but our external stimulus is asking something of us, or we're thinking of doing something. So finding a quiet seat somewhere that you can close your eyes and allow your attention to go inwards inside your body for a moment. And maybe at this point, you become aware of what's happening with the speed of your breath. Perhaps we're noticing that the breath could feel shallow and quick. Maybe your breath feels calm, full, slow. Just that noticing, we're not judging anything about what's happening, just taking in information. Maybe you're noticing how your physical body is arriving. Are you carrying tension or are there feelings of lightness or tingling, buzzing? Scanning around and feeling if there's a sense of urgency happening anywhere for you in your own needs, your hunger, your thirst, your state of alertness. Tuning into your heart space here. And if this isn't a practice that you're already familiar with, if this idea of an internal cup or battery is not familiar to you, maybe just imagining the entire being of your body is a vessel. There's an amount of of energy moving inside you. And if you could gauge that with a number out of a hundred. And this number can fluctuate from moment to moment, experience to experience. But this number is gonna be a guiding light and experience for you to then ask yourself, am I available for others? feeling that number and just holding it or, or picturing a level within your body where it's arriving. Take a really big inhale, filling your lungs up as much as you possibly can and exhale with a sigh and slowly open your eyes. And for me in this exercise was really unique because I, I do have toddlers running around outside the door at the moment. And so even as I started the check-in, my check-in was maybe a little bit higher for what I could give. And then I was like, oh, it just dropped to like 20 points. I'm like, oh, there's something demanding my attention. <laughs> love that. I love that. Once uh, it brought up for me too, I loved how you asked the question, am I available for other? And I imagine if the audience is like me, it's like, I always want to be, but oftentimes I can't. And so knowing, honoring the wanting to be, that's almost always there, but then checking in with your body, like, can I right now actually? And being really honest with ourselves is kind of what I'm taking away. So as we wrap up, Sarah, um, how can people connect with you? 
Absolutely. So they can find me on my website, blissyogaottawa.com. I am on Facebook, um, either my business page, Bliss Yoga Ottawa. I have a nude yoga group, Fair Bliss Yoga. And I am on Instagram as well. I can put some of my handles down in the show notes. Um, it's been so wonderful to not only share the entire series with all of you and the creative team, um, but also each individual week of journeying, the offerings that we've been doing, and these habitual insights, practices, and bringing them forward. Thank you. Same here. And I think it's so cool that we're doing our last session on your birthday. It just feels really <laughs> awesome to me. Um, Absolutely. I feel so proud and so appreciated and so valued for everything that you're doing for the community and um, and fill up your cup like this is your day and uh, like enjoy it fully because I think as people who like Brian like yourself like Amanda like we do a lot for others and our our downfall we have to be careful of is you know doing that from a place of like you say Brian wanting to but not being able to. So this is such a great reminder for me. And I love the tool that you just shared with us, Sarah. I'm gonna carry that with me for the rest of my life around just checking and looking for that internal number. That brings me so much clarity and guidance. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Um, One thing that I'll just send as a takeaway to the whole community to know that it is a radical act of self-love to make sure that we're checking in here first. Those of us who are givers, who do feel that benefit and that glow from doing for others, um, even honoring FOMO and some other requests that may happen. But when I take care of me and you take care of you, we can take care of we, and we can get through this pandemic together. Well said. Love it. Thank you, Sarah. Brian, thank you for co-hosting. Thank you. Awesome. To the whole community, stay happy. Be well. Bye.